nothing could stop Rome, for it was destined to rule the world. From humble beginnings, this small city would turn into the world's most revered and powerful empire that ruled Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa for more than 600 years. But what if you could rewrite history? What if you can stop Rome? What if you could create a different world? Hello everyone and welcome back to Game Brigade. I'm your host Brian and on this show we do reviews, previews and playthroughs of your favorite games. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing. Today we're taking a look at Conqueror Final Conquest, a game set in the 3rd century BC where players will be taking on the six different factions from Rome, Egypt, Carthage, Gaul. You'll be able to choose one of these factions and decide how are you going to play out history. Conqueror Final Conquest is, in my opinion, a gateway war game for people that want to bring people into the war gaming realm, but not intimidate you with a lot of heavy rules. We're going to be covering the rules, the theme, as well as my personal opinion of this game here in this review. So let's do a quick dive into the rule set, going first with player armies. So in Conqueror Final Conquest, we're going to be having multiple armies fielded by different units. At the top here, you're going to see that there's a chart that talks about the supply and the units. This game is directly related to the food supply available in the game. You can see the different types of food located on the map. So the Roman army starts with two food already in their supply because they have units on top of those territories. So then they would reference the chart and see that they can have up to eight total units on the field. This is important because as you start building your units and record, recruiting your units, you need to make sure that you're always in supply for your food to make sure that you're not going to be having anyone starving on the battlefield. You can never field more units than your current supply. Here at the home factory of, or the home city of Rome, you'll also see that there's a castle as well as a coin. At the start of your turn, you'll collect your coins for any territories that you control that include water or, or include money, as well as be able to recruit units. You're able to recruit units in the castle here or in the towers. The castle allows you to recruit up to two infantry units, these little boys, or one cavalry unit. While the tower only lets you recruit one infantry unit. Your actions that you can take on that turn are only allowed to do one of two things. You can move or attack. Very simple. And combat is fairly simple as well. Let's go ahead and take a quick example of what combat would look like. Here we have the Greek army with a cavalry unit and a, uh, an infantry unit, as well as the Roman army with a cavalry unit and an infantry unit. If the Roman player is declaring attack here, they have three army power here and three army power here. Cavalry are two power, infantry are one power. You will then determine who the defender is. The defender will always get plus one in combat. So this one will actually have four power and then each player will roll dice. The, cal the Greek player rolls a one, while the Roman player rolls a three. You will then add up these values and then determine how much the difference is will determine how many units the defender lost. So in this situation, we'll remove these two units away and we'll move forward with the Roman unit. There are other ways that we can spice up the combat. If the players had purchased player card, hero cards in their game, such as these ones here, these can be revealed during combat to give special abilities. For example, this is Julius Caesar, who gives plus four to any combat role, as well as special abilities. And Julius Caesar's special, abil special ability says two Roman infantry units gain plus two strength each in combat in this battle. You gain additional two strength if you're fighting Gaul, Greece, or Egypt, in this battle. So it takes special note of who you're fighting, what your objectives are, and what you're gonna be doing when you're playing these cards. But these cards do not come cheap, they're expensive, uh, and they're a one-time use, and so once you, you use them, they go back to your, your section here. You could rebuy them again, but that does get very expensive to continually keep buying those cards. To win the game, a player needs to control at least five of these uh, towers, or these castles, and they need to control it through their turn. To spice things up, each player will be given a random mission card. These mission cards are fairly simple, 
Uh, but generally what we found is that they are made to create conflict within the party and also give you a, a goal to move towards to keep things moving. This game is a very sandboxy game, so it can be easy to get confused or not sure what the next best strategy is. You can always reference your, your mission card, and once you complete a mission card, you'll draw another one. All the mission cards do is, is uh, give you currency, which you then can use to purchase more heroes. The final thing in this game that will affect the gameplay is they have these chronicle cards that are gonna affect the entire board, which are revealed starting on turn two, and then they have an effect affecting everyone in the game. So we will reveal one, and here we have one called Slave Revolt. It said, players need to bid a combined total of six currency to defeat the slave army. So each player will be then bidding in secret how much money they're going to bid to defeat this slave revolt. If the slaves are victorious, everyone will lose three currency. So if we aren't able to combine our funds to get the six gold, we'll all lose three gold. The lowest bidder, though, will lose six currency. So you definitely don't want to not bid unless you don't have any money. The highest, uh, if players are victorious though, whoever bid the most will also receive five currency for doing so. So these will be revealed and then shuffled back up once they're going through. So we have Force March. You have a bunch of different types of things. Germanic tribes attack uh, that change the overall landscape of the field. It changes how gameplays can be, can be played. Uh, for example, there's one that says the plague where no one is able to recruit units that turn. So if you were planning to build up an army and to strike your opponents and also you get the plague, you're no longer able to recruit units that turn. It could severely change your decision making. And decision making is important in this game. The developers really wanted to make sure that everyone was engaged in the game and were thoughtful in the game. So they added this weird, interesting mechanic called the bribery system, which utilizes this one minute timer. When the player begins their turn, they will have to flip this over. And it is recommended to have a single player be the, uh, the sand counter person. That way everyone is uh, fairly being counted. But when this is flipped over, the player will have one minute to think about their turn. They can decide where they wanted to recruit units. They can decide how much income they're going to get. They can think about what movements they're going to do. But if, a, that, if that player does not make an action in the sense that they do not make a move or an attack, by the time this timer runs out, a savvy opponent could pay money to buy their players away. So... The important factor in this, though, is you have to make sure you bid the exact amount of the armies in that territory to gain control. So in this situation, it would require three different gold pieces to bid them because I, unfortunately, took too long. This is an interesting mechanic because it's intended to keep everyone invested in the game, keep everyone uh, excited for their turns and to keep the gameplay rolling at a smooth pace. I found the mechanic to be cumbersome and not enjoyable and more of a, a got you situation. I can see why the developer put it in there, but it definitely feels like something that doesn't add much to the game. And as we played further along, we never really had a situation where the bribing mechanic ever came into play. And you would think while well, reading the rule book, and it takes up an entire page of the rule book, and the rule book is very condensed as it is. It's a pretty well thought out rule book, very simplified. So to have an entire page dedicated to the bribing mechanic and never to see it come into effect really in the game was an interesting choice. But it's there if you want to take advantage of it. The other factor of this game that I want to talk about is movement. You'll see that there are channels and waterways as well as land territories. Every piece of movement is just one piece of movement to enter. So if I want to take this cavalry unit, I can enter him here in the ocean. And anywhere this water is connected, this player can move. So in two turns, I could go from Rome all the way to Libya. So that dynamic of being able to move quickly through the territories using the water paths changes the type of strategies you're going to do, and where are you most vulnerable. As a Roman player, when I was playing this game as Rome, I wanted to expand north and take control of the Gaul and Britannia. But I found that I was leaving my back, my rear capital here, 
severely exposed from people that can attack me through the water. You are able to leave units in the water if you want. So if this person decided to enter this territory, you can have a massive sea battle, which is always enjoyable. But you have to always remember that someone from Egypt fairly quickly could make their way to Rome and not be expecting it. And it's even more exasperated on the three to four player board, which is different if you play on the alternate side. Another interesting factor is this river here is considered connected. So if you're here, you could end up down here. It's a really interesting mechanic in terms of how they, how they transfer yourself across the board. And it does open up different aspects of combat and, and um, different types of situations you can, you can use. There are bridges throughout the game that do connect, it signify that those are connected pieces. So while yes, I could go here and then here, I could also just move with one turn straight across the bridge. So that's the generic basic rule set of the game. We've covered pretty much everything. It's a pretty simplified game. So let's talk about what I thought about it in the theme section. Conquer Final Conquest really brought out a very interesting theme. You would think it would be with simplified meeples, a simplified board, that it's not going to have as much theme or, or direct pull into you that you would expect. But I was actually surprised with how much actual real life combat was occurring with Rome and Carthage where I was trying to take over both Europe because Europe has so much valuable resources, but my mission was taking me to North Africa. So I was pulling myself between multiple situations. And as Rome, I'm surrounded. I've got everyone coming after me because I'm easy targets for everyone. So it was really an interesting pull between all the factions and how they're playing out. I love the fact that you have these, all, uh, these secondary units in there to kind of be uh, a gateway barrier for people to just steamroll through. Uh, there was a lot of interesting facts, and I do really like that the bonus missions that are included in the game really do help flesh out that experience where the, the uh, Romans are trying to take North Africa or they're trying to take over Gaul and Britannia. It really gives you a sense of this is what these factions truly were trying to do at this time in 3rd century BC. I do think that the best part of the game, though, comes in the table talk. There's a lot of conversations uh, determining like uh, what you want to convince people to do. There's a lot of backstabbing happening. Uh, you can actually just freely trade money with people if you want to convince them to do something. You can use your, your, your income to try to influence their decisions, but they could accept your money and then not pass forward with it. It's really interesting how your player group will take forward with this type of action. So what did I think of Conquer Final Conquest? I think the game is nearly there. This definitely felt more of a 95% completed game than a fully completed game. Not to necessarily say my experience wasn't bad and I'm not gonna play this game again, because I will but there were aspects of the game that I was wanting more. I think the combat with it being uh, the way it is in terms of all or nothing, you can't really whittle down an army. You either win or you lose. It's kind of hard to, to, to wrap your head around, especially when you're used to a lot of war games where you could attack from multiple sections and start whittling away to capital. If a player has really fortified a place, a single territory with multiple units, there's real no way that you're going to win that combat at all. There's just not, there's just not enough resources that you can divulge into that to whittle them down or punish them for just amassing a massive ball across the territories. I did like the table talk, as I said earlier, the, my favorite part of the game was the enjoyment of people laughing and playing and deciding how we're going to do it. We had a massive three-player uh, skirmish over Alexandria. For whatever reason, everyone wanted to be down there, especially in Thebes. And the chatter and discussion of, don't go there. You better not go there. I'm, I'm not leaving. And then people calling bluffs. It was a lot of fun. And it's one of the aspects of why I enjoy a game that's so gateway and light that you could bring in a lot of different player levels of board gamers into this experience. A lot of times we look at a war game and we think that they're going to be hard to learn or hard to grasp. But if you can grasp games like Risk, which even has you know similar mechanics, 
you can guess you can easily grasp conquer final conquest overall i really do recommend conquer final conquest i think there's a lot of potential here with the systems here and after speaking with mohammed al Qadi, i'm very impressed with what he's done and as a first time publisher and i think is the first one out of the uae this is really impressive stuff I'm really excited to see what he's going to do. He does mention that there's going to be an expansion pack for this game, which will be making a little bit more of a heavier system with adding more units, adding more hero cards, potentially just adding more stuff like the Chronicle cards. There's so much more design implementation available here. I just feel like it needs a little bit more. So maybe the expansion pack will be the thing that fixes the game. I do have to say, though, I don't necessarily like that it's a half finished game when i say half finished it's more of a qualical because i do think it's like 90 percent finished there was just a little bit more work that needed to be done to fully finish this game for me but overall i had a great time i want to thank everyone who stayed till the end of the show what did you guys think of conquer final conquest let me know in the comment section down below if you're here for the current giveaway we have two giveaways going on right now if you want to make sure that they're still active for the first giveaway, which is a $99 pledge level for Oathsworn, click the video card up here for more information on that. If you're looking for your secret word to leave in the comment section down below, leave something with the word Rome somewhere inside the comments. If you are here for the Wingspan Digital Edition giveaway, make sure you go to my Instagram page. You're going to want to be following me. You're going to look for the Should You Back It on 7th Citadel. Leave a comment, tag a friend and you'll be entered in that giveaway. That giveaway will be finalized this Friday, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Again, thank you everyone who stayed until the end. I appreciate all of you guys for supporting the channel. We are so close to getting fully uh, partnered with YouTube. I didn't think it would actually happen to get myself partnered with YouTube, but we are literally there. We're on the doorsteps of it, so thank you again for all the support, all the love and support of the community. Uh, we're going to have more reviews coming, so stay tuned to the channel. Talk to you all very soon.